Welcome to Pet Squares. We're back. I'm Adam Marsland, your host for the Geek's Guide to the Beach Boys. And today we are looking at the Beach Boys Partey. And uh, glad to be back with you here. It's Christmas here in Cambodia where I'm at right now. And uh, as we're looking at this album, let's cast our minds back. Oh, so many years to Christmas 1965 when Capitol Records, the Beach Boys record label, had a problem. You see, they wanted to sell a Beach Boys album and there weren't none. Brian Wilson, the Beach Boys leader and producer, was just in the beginning stages of the next Beach Boys studio album, which he was planning to make the greatest rock and roll record ever made. And it was to be called, as we all know now, Remember the Zoo? Yeah. So that's what was going on in the fall of 65. And uh, Capitol Records wanted a new album for Christmas. The Beach Boys knew that wasn't going to happen. Brian Wilson in particular knew that wasn't going to happen, so they cast about for a ready-made solution to solve Capitol's marketing woes. They thought about having a live album, and they'd actually tried to cut one earlier that year. Didn't really pan out, and they'd actually done a live album the previous year anyway, so they'd kind of already done that. Thought about doing a Greatest Hits album. That seemed a little premature. Finally, they hit on having a live in this studio Beach Boys Partey. Uh, now, 1965 was the beginning of the folk rock boom in the United States. The folk revival that had taken place in the early 60s had given way to an electrified folk sound epitomized by bands like the Birds and uh, the Beatles' adoption of the 12-string guitar. Uh, the Beach Boys themselves had started experimenting with a more acoustic sound on the prior album, Summer Days and Summer Nights, with the track Girl Don't Tell Me. It came out real swell, uh, and that probably was an influence in their idea to just do a sort of a, a hootenanny-style record where the Beach Boys would be sitting around at a theoretical party just shooting the shit, playing covers and, you know, just having a good time. And it was basically a brilliant idea, a way to kind of do a low effort album that would check the box, give Capital something to sell, get them off Brian's back so he could make Remember the Zoo, which as we all know would soon become Pet Sounds, widely regarded as one of the greatest rock and roll albums of all time. But before that, we have the Beach Boys Party and that's what we're gonna be talking about today. But before that, a little bit of business. It has been some time since uh, you've seen a Pet Squares show, and I'm sorry about that. And I want to keep these coming, and I'm hoping they'll be coming at a faster pace. But uh, I am trying to do these things right, and there's a certain amount of uh, research that has to take place. And uh, there have been five international moves since this series has started. Uh, but also, I've had a slew of new videos up on the channel that have taken my time. There's a whole series of live in Cambodia videos, stuff I've done as a musician, if you're interested in checking that out. And I also recently posted the 50th episode of the flagship series on this channel, Adam Walks Around. And uh, if you haven't seen that yet, I strongly encourage you to check it out. You might like it. You never know. It takes place in the Philippines. But we're now back with Pet Squares. And um, the last episode that we did of Pet Squares, which covered summer days and summer nights, I finally got around to doing a long-awaited uh, patron-only episode, and I want to express thanks to all the, the patrons and contributors that have kept this channel going. And I want to tell you all that in conjunction with today's show, uh, there's going to be uh, another little thing for the patrons and the people that contribute to the channel, and you guys are amazing. This album, Beach Boys Party, was actually somewhat parodied by my own band, uh, Adam Marsland's Chaos Band, or AMCB for short. We were a long-running band uh, anchored around me, Evie Sands, uh, Teresa Cowles, and Kurt Medlin, and we had a, a bunch of floating people around that, including Beach Boys archivist Alan Boyd, and drummer George Barba, and a guy named Rob Z. And uh, uh, several years back, we did a, a show called 50 Sides of the Beach Boys, where we did 50 Beach Boys songs. And uh, somewhere around this time, we did uh, sort of a, a, a bootleg album we called AMCB Party. And what it was, was it was a collection of studio tracks that had some sort of Beach Boys theme. And we also, uh, the band and George and Rob and Alan, we all got together in my room and we basically did our own faux version of the Beach Boys Party, except we did different songs, Beach Boys Party style. And the reason I'm bringing this up is uh, as a thank you to all the patrons and contributors to the channel. You will have a very hard time finding this now, but I've decided in conjunction with the show that I'm going to do a little digital 
download of this privately. For those of you that are already patrons and uh, contributors, uh, you'll be getting that link. And for those of you that are interested, please check the first comment for how you can become a contributor or a patron subscriber to this channel and get cool stuff like that. So anyway, enough of the biz. Um, let me see, is there anything else I want to tell you? Oh yes, um, before we launch into Beach Boys Party, I want to let you know that we are also going to be talking about the single that was not on the album, but that was released concurrently with the album, The Little Girl I Once Knew, and that is a big topic, and we're gonna get into that at the end. So uh, if you're waiting to hear about that, and a bunch of you asked me if I was gonna cover that, yes, we're gonna talk about it at the end of this episode, so stay tuned for that. Okay, so let's get into the overview of Beach Boys Party. It was released November 8th, 1965. It Fulfilled all of Capital's dreams. It was a massive hit. Went to number six in the U.S., number three in the U.K. Had a big hit single that came out of nowhere. We'll be talking a lot about that, too. Um, so uh, this basically is the first unplugged album, which is a concept that came to full flower in the 90s with the MTV Unplugged series, Nirvana Unplugged, and everybody else unplugged. This was the first time uh, you had an electric rock band reinterpreting their sound in an acoustic way rather than an actual folk band doing their thing. The Beach Boys emphatically were not a folk band. You can hear their sort of at distance ironic take on the folk movement uh, throughout this album. We'll be covering that a little more as we go along. Uh, but they were trying this out for this album and uh, it, you know, it, it was a really interesting way to go because uh, there was a large element of self-parody to this album and coming at a time when rock and roll was just beginning to start taking itself seriously uh, it was a really interesting idea to do an album that basically had the band demystifying itself and, and not taking itself very seriously in fact deliberately trying to be kind of bad at some time uh, I think there was more than a little Jan and Dean influence in this approach. Uh, this was part of Jan and Dean's charm, not taking anything away from the genius of Jan Berry or the charisma of Dean Torrance, but they weren't the greatest singers in the world and they knew it. And uh, part of their shtick uh, that was really endearing is they made no bones about it. <laughs> in fact, we talked a while earlier that Dean actually testified in the trial of his uh, peripheral involvement in the kidnapping of Frank Sinatra Jr. And one of the things Dean owned up to on the stand was he wasn't a very good singer, which I thought was kind of interesting. It's really apropos of nothing, but obviously on his mind. Uh, but anyway, uh, so I think Jan and Dean's sort of casual attitude and Jan and Dean being such good friends of the Beach Boys, I, I think this probably also was an uh, uncredited influence on this idea to let's just get everybody in a room and just let it all hang out, baby. So, um, talking overview of the album, there are no drums on this album. Uh, there's mostly bongos and tambourine. Virtually no keyboards, even though there was a piano in the room that they were working in. You can hear people banging on it in, in between takes. And uh, There's a Celeste around. It gets played on, on rare occasions. Um, and it's interesting to consider that even though um, they're worlds apart in other ways, this is a very similar album in its approach to Smiley Smile, which would come out two years later, which is Beach Boys, probably the Beach Boys' weirdest record, and, but had a similar unplugged approach. Very little, if any, drums, uh, mostly vocal-oriented, and everything stripped down to a couple of instruments, in that case, to a Baldwin organ, but in this case, this is a Beach Boys album that's completely centered around the acoustic guitar. In fact, I believe the only one that is centered around the acoustic guitar, and uh, it's really interesting because the Beach Boys sound, this sort of crisp, clear vocal sound, really lends itself to blending well with the acoustic guitar. And as I had said, they had first tried this on the Summer Days and Summer Nights album. They would revisit the sound uh, periodically as they moved into the 70s. Uh, I Can Hear Music, um, Add Some Music to Your Day, uh, some, a couple of other tracks really blended the sort of airy Beach Boys vocal sound with that very alpine, if you will, uh, sensibility of having an acoustic guitar based track. Uh, this probably also coincided somewhat with Carl Wilson's ascendancy to the band as primary producer, as obviously Carl was a guitar player and Brian could play a little bit, not, not like Carl could. It wasn't going to deliver that big strummy, expansive vibe. 
that Carl and, to a lesser extent, Al could. And it's also worth mentioning that Al Jardine uh, was a folk buff. None of the other guys really had much interest in folk music that I'm aware of. Uh, I know that Carl Wilson uh, was into cowboy music a little bit, uh, which is sort of country and western, but Carl was more of a soul guy and a Beatles guy. Uh, but you do have the other guys, uh, the guitar players in the band, ex exerting influence here because there's a lot of Beatles influence on this album. There's three Beatles covers. And there's a lot of folk influence on this album. And um, Carl and Al are front and center as instrumentalists. In fact, one noteworthy thing about this album is this is the first album where Al functions as a rhythm guitar player. Most of the time in the studio, Al played bass. And again, I think this is one of the only times that Al actually reprised his onstage role as rhythm guitar player in the studio. I think he did it to some extent on the MIU album, uh, and I can't think of another time when he did. There may be one, but I can't think of it. Um, so that's interesting. So let's go to the musician credits, because unlike most of the episodes of this series, I'm probably not going to do uh, individual credits for each of these tracks, because it's, it, basically there's a lot of mixing and matching going on. Uh, I do know to some extent who played what, uh, but I'm going to tell you, broadly speaking, we have Carl and Al on 6 and 12 string acoustic guitars, although they were amped. In other words, they were really electric acoustic guitars where you had um, them playing through a pickup and then going through a Fender amp and then mic'd, and the, that's the recording engineer in me is just going, Ugh. but anyway, that's what they did. Uh, then you had the electric bass, which was played alternately by Bruce Johnston, who just picked up the instrument a couple of months earlier, but they said, here you go, Bruce uh, and Brian. And it's unclear who does what. Bruce at one point claimed he only played bass in one song. This is clearly incorrect. And on other uh, occasions, he owned up to doing more. We can take a good guess at who's doing what on some of the tracks. And then the others, we'll leave it up to the mysteries of the ages. On percussion, bongos are the main instrument. We have a number of people playing bongos. Hal Blaine, uh, Dennis... Uh, Ray Avery, who was the photographer at the session, and then we have some tambourinists, Ron Swallow, who tambourined a lot for the Beach Boys in 65, their cousin Steve Korthoff, uh, Bruce's partner Terry Melcher, and also a very key player making his first appearance on the album, and I'm going to make a big deal out of introducing him, so I'll leave you uh, guessing as to who that might be. Uh, Dennis is not heard that much on this album uh, because he had bronchitis at this time. Apparently he went skin diving with a cold, according to teen magazines of the time. He is on it. Uh, he does play little bongos. On one session he played harmonica and uh, apparently played quite well, although n none of that made it to the album. Unfortunately, there's an outtake where you can hear him. Dennis is singing a little. Uh, he's, he doesn't seem to be there a lot. Uh, and I didn't listen very carefully for him, but he seems to have sat out a lot of the vocals. Seemingly, again, we have this thing happening where with Bruce in the band now um, and the band switching over to studio players, Dennis is not as crucial to the studio sessions, and we start to see him sitting out sessions. Uh, and this, as I've said before, this myth that Dennis didn't play and he didn't sing it seems to have arisen from the period when they were the most outside people at the sessions, which was the non-self-contained sessions, which happened around 65, 66, early 67. And so it's somewhat true here. Dennis is on the album, but he's not on everything. And he's, I think he's singing in a limited capacity, but I don't know how much. I, I can definitely hear him on one thing, uh, but uh, there are others that could probably chime in there. Um, David Marks, of course, is long gone from the, uh, from the band at this time, but oddly he seems to be on their minds because he gets mentioned all the time. There's a running gag all through these sessions where they go, where's Dave? And, uh, it, it, and there's one point where they make it very clear they're talking about David Marks. So Dave Marks not on this record, but once again, he's, he's sort of there in spirit. Uh, the engineer for the first half of the record was a guy named Don Blake. It wasn't their normal guy, Chuck Britz. I got a feeling he was probably on vacation because he does come in later on, so it seems like he was just kind of gone. Interestingly, Don Blake was Western uh, Recorders. That's the studio they were at, their typical studio. Uh, Don Blake was the studio's former owner, so it does sound like Chuck Britz took a break, uh, called in Don and uh, said, do me a solid and uh, run these sessions, and he did. 
So this is a very unique album in the band's discography, obviously, although I've said it does bear some similarities to the Smiley Smile. Um, critical opinion on the album is quite mixed, uh, like the other Beach Boys specialty items, uh, such as Concert and the Christmas album. People kind of bring to it whatever they bring to it. And, uh, you know, I've, I've, it's been interesting doing this show because there's been shows that I've thought were more were better than other shows, uh, but the shows that get viewed the most tend to be the albums that people like the most, and that, that's kind of interesting, and, and I've noticed that the concert uh, show, which is one of the better episodes of the series, I think, um, doesn't get viewed as much, and I don't take that personally. I think people just don't dig that album that much, and I'm curious to see how people react to this show, because it will give me some sense of the overall fan appreciation for this album, but I think it's probably less appreciated than the albums that are around it. I think that's a safe bet considering Summer Days and Summer Nights and Pet Sounds are acknowledged to be the Be uh, the Beach Boys peak albums by most people. So you have this sort of outlier in the middle of that where they're just kind of taking the piss out of themselves. So not everybody's going to want to hear this, but it's really cool for what it is. Uh, but one thing that's very key about this album is it is certainly the last gasp of the Beach Boys fun in the sun image uh, until the 70s at least when Endless Summer comes back and they, they regress a little bit. But the uh, Beach Boys uh, easily marketable sort of carefree you know, summer happy-go-lucky sound. This is the last album where you get that. It's interesting to consider that Barbara Ann, which spoiler alert became the huge hit from this album, was a hit in January 1966 and you have Sloop John B, which is sort of the transitional uh, track uh, between the fun in the sun to the, the arty stuff. Uh, that's, so Sloop John B is kind of the very last sort of fun Beach Boys nautical themed track. Uh, the old style Beach Boys uh, sound was still very popular going into 1966. So uh, 1966, of course, is the year when it all came together and then all fell apart for the Beach Boys. And it's interesting to consider that the old school Beach Boys sound was still very, very popular in the early part of 66. You know, it's interesting to contemplate that, I'm not saying he should have done this because obviously we're happy Pet Sounds happened, but if Brian had stuck with a hybrid approach that he had with Summer Days and Summer Nights, where he had a little bit of the fun in the sun, but the, the higher production standards for one more album, uh, if the Beach Boys commercial fortunes might have been better timed for the zeitgeist, um, it's just a thought. I'm not saying it should have happened that way. It's just interesting to think that this album was a big hit and that hitness carried on into 66, which of course was the year of Pet Sounds. There were a lot of records coming out around this time that were sort of capitalizing on the folk boom. I mentioned Jan and Dean already. They had an album that came out virtually simultaneously with this called Folk and Roll. Um, so again, you get the sense that there was some cross-pollination of ideas there. Jan and Dean, as we'll see, were right next door cutting uh, at that time, so it's, there's no way it didn't make an impression on the guys. Capital went all out promoting this. They had uh, Beach Boys Party potato chips. You gotta wonder if there's a bag out there somewhere, and if you eBayed it, if you could find it, and just how nasty those potato chips would be, or would they still be edible after 50 odd years? I guess it's closing in on 60 years now. Supposedly a million of these uh, promotional items were shipped to stores, uh, meaning the potato chips. Um, this was Capital's promotional wet dream. I mean, Brian gave them exactly what they wanted and Brian got what he wanted, which is Capital off his back and a fairly easy workload. Um, Capital were very quick to pull the rug out from uh, the what was supposed to be the focus track, Little Girl I Once Knew, uh, which was certainly where Brian's heart was at in terms of, you know, that was, a purpose-built hit single and we'll talk a lot more about that when we get to that but it's worth knowing that when they got into the studio it's clear the band all understood the broad concept but they weren't totally clear on how they were going to do this like the first session didn't really produce anything that they could use and they started out where they were just going to do the instrumental tracks and overdub later and then it quickly became obvious that the way to go was to do the vocals and the instruments at the same time, which is kind of unusual even in those days. Uh, but it makes sense for this approach. Uh, and this, we copied this for the MCB 
party thing that I was telling you about earlier. It took them a, a session or half a session to figure out this is the way to do it. But they would they would cut with the guys with the acoustic instruments and the bass and all of them singing. And then later they had a, a simulated party with, with invited a bunch of friends over and they would sort of loosely double uh, in kind of a gangbang fashion uh, the tracks that they had already done. Uh, with all the sort of party noise in the back, and uh, this created the overall sonic vibe of the album. So kind of a neat way to go, but it took them a while to evolve this, and there's a, a fascinating track on what uh, I should mention was an expanded version of this album that came out in 2015 called Uncovered and Unplugged, which goes through all of the sessions for this. There are 81 tracks, and uh, the sessions first started on August 23rd, and the, uh, there's a track called Let's Get This Party Rolling, which seems to be right at the beginning. And you can hear the band kind of settling into this idea. Um, Carl says, instead of being good, it's got to be entertaining. And so he's kind of setting the tone. Then you hear Al very hilariously parody himself, up, again, setting the tone, uh, when they did uh, Cash's Love versus Sonny Wilson. Uh, doing, hi, this is Al Jardine, and this is what takes place at a typical Beach Boy party. And Brian just kind of shuts him up. And then they pretend to do some spontaneous stuff. Brian walks in and goes, hi, fellas. And Bruce says, are you making another hit album? Carl doodles the Sloop John B riff. Da, da, da. Someone relates it to Ticket to Ride. And then Brian comes in and says, concentrate on the playing. Don't overemphasize the singing. And it's worth uh, noting that Carl's leading the band on the sessions, mostly. Sounds like. Um, again, Brian's not always playing, which is interesting. Um, Mike doesn't seem to be there at the first session, which makes sense because at that time they're thinking they're going to overdub the band. But then from then on, they decide they're going to do it all together. So Mike's pretty much there for the tracking. Again, another unusual thing. Uh, there does seem to be a bit of hierarchy in the studio. Uh, it seems to be Brian, then Carl, then Bruce, which is interesting. I talked about this before. Bruce coming into the album as a newbie, you know, his political position in the band as a band member was kind of low man on the totem pole. But as someone with his own production experience and a lot of industry experience, he was clearly accorded a lot of respect in the studio. And um, it, it, it wasn't taken amiss if Bruce offered up his perspective from a production standpoint. And he, it sounds like he's very integrated, very comfortable with the band. In fact, in, in some ways, he's displaced Dennis a little bit, and uh, even Al a little bit. Uh, but we should mention, Al is central instrumentally to this album. He's playing guitar all the way through. This is the one of the very few Beach Boys albums where that is the case. And so I think that gets us uh, to the party started, as I just said. So let's jump right in with the first track. And that first track is Holy Golly. And just parenthetically, I want to say one of the coolest things about doing this show is some of the rabbit holes I get to go down research wise when I'm doing this. Now, uh, I should mention that I have a lot of help on this show, uh, most primarily from Craig Sawinski, uh, who is the world's authority on Beach Boys sessions. And there is quite a bit of uh, research that he has fed by some other luminaries in the Beach Boys world who I have discussed earlier. Uh, and uh, also other people chime in. Uh, Mark A. Moore, who is the world's authority on Jan and Dean, uh, gave me some info on this. Uh, a number of other people, again, talked to, talked about before. Um, but uh, I, you know, I do a lot of my own research, and the thing that's most interesting to me is sometimes is going down the rabbit holes on the side of all the sort of side players and the bit players and all these and all these cover songs that I don't know the story behind. And so this album is another one of those. Uh, opportunities to learn more about rock and roll history, which I find kind of fascinating, and I hope you do too. So having said all that, uh, Holly Gully is a song that was a uh, hit for the Olympics. And when I say hit, barely. It went to number 72 in 1959, but uh, Mike and Brian for sure um, were avid R&B fans. And uh, I, you know, I, I didn't really get into Mike's contribution when we were talking about, I didn't talk about him at all. And that was actually uh, not cool because Mike Love really shines on this record because first of all, it's right up his wheelhouse, that kind of goofy humor. Uh, but also Mike is the one guy in the band that really understood R&B 
at least the R&B of the 50s. It, that was a very um, seminal music influence for Mike. So pulling out these old 50s R&B chestnuts and, and having Mike sing them, it's right in his wheelhouse. He's got the right kind of attitude for him. You know, his whole vocal approach um, has a lot of roots in the coasters and Lieber Stoller, those kind of, uh, those, that kind of writing, those kind of songs, those kind of bands. So it doesn't surprise me that the band was aware of Holly Golly, but I should also make it clear, uh, the Olympics version was far from the only uh, version of the song that was out there. It was covered a lot. And uh, the, the term Holly Golly derives from a game, and it later turned into a dance craze, which had a kind of a life of its own. And the song... Uh, was repurposed with new lyrics uh, that were called Peanut Butter, and then that was done to the Holly Gully dance, and actually Wooly Bully, which sounds like Holly Gully, was influenced by Holly Gully, but they changed it to Wooly Bully because the Wooly Bully didn't go to the same dance moves as Holly Gully. It, you know, Holly Gully had this whole, we could do a whole show about Holly Gully. We're not gonna, but just wanted to say, you, know, you gotta give up some, some credit to Holly Gully. Holly Gully was written by Fred Sledge Smith and Cliff Goldsmith. Uh, this was recorded at the second session, which was on September 8th. That was the first session to yield anything usable for the band. Um, Hal Blaine is on bongos for this session. Uh, Terry Melcher and Ron Swallow are alternating on tambourine. First voice we hear is Marilyn, Brian's wife, talking in the background. We're going to hear her a lot, and she sings a little bit also. Um, some of the chatter that we hear is, uh, is fascinating. We have the first of many sort of slightly deprecating um, slants on the current folk rock movement when Brian says, we'll have Greenwich Village just like that. Greenwich Village being, of course, the epicenter of the folk rock movement in 64, 65. Um, as I said, Mike's in rare form. His Blue Notes show why he was such a rock and roll asset. They all developed into credible rock singers. Even Bruce, he, he could do, there's this one, live thing from 1970 where, where someone's doing a blood-curdling heavy metal scream and I had to stop to figure out who it was it was Bruce. I was like, who do we could sing like that? Like, wow! I was like, wow. Okay, so anyway, but at that time, the guy that really understood rock and roll and, and, and R&B singing was Mike. Now, speaking of Mike singing, Mike sings falsetto on this track. Um, he, he, and, uh, and, he, and he, when we hear Mike do falsetto, which is rare, he's usually screwing around. We rarely hear him hit an actual note, but he hits uh, a, a falsetto note at 47 seconds and a little less convincingly at one minute and 25 seconds. And I thought it sounded pretty high. I went to the piano. It's an E5. That's really high. Um, like that is all, that's just under the highest note I can hit. And it's right up there. It's, I think it's higher than Dennis could go. So he, Mike could hit an E5, which was news to me. Um, that's really high. Um, so he only hit it for one, one second. You know, it's not like he was carrying the thing, but who knew? Mike's got, Mike had that note. Um, the double tracking of Mike's vocal, which took place uh, during the party session, drops out unexpectedly in spots. That's sort of introduces us to the casual nature of the recording. And as the track fades out uh, in its sort of chaotic but well-harmonized fashion, which is pretty much going to be the sound of the whole album, uh, we, hear, uh, we hear Marilyn still gabbing away, and we need, we need Peter Jackson to get in there and isolate her voice, find out what she was talking about, because she's talking all the way through this about something. I kind of want to know what it is. Next we have I Should Have Known Better and The Beatles front and center as they will be for this album. The Beatles were a pretty hard to ignore cultural force in 65. Uh, and it's interesting to note that Murray Wilson who hated the Beatles because they were taking attention away from his sons and attention away from them at Capitol Records because they were on the same label. Murray didn't like the Beatles. Uh, Carl was a huge fan and Murray gave him grief because Carl had a Beatles poster in his room. Uh, Brian was a big fan too, although felt a little more threatened by them, <laughs> understandably. And uh, it's interesting to note that with Murray Wilson now out of the picture as their manager, uh, the Beach Boys, when they're doing a covers album, three Beatles covers, and the band clearly likes their 64, 65 strummy phase. This is from the Hard Day's Night soundtrack from 64, the B-side of Hard Day's Night. It was, as a B-side, a number 53 hit in the U.S. It was a big hit on its own in Europe. 
It's how on the bongos. Uh, I don't didn't write down which session it was. It's one of the later sessions, and he's cramming it in because he had to leave that session at 8 p.m. I think it might have been the third session. If I recall correctly, there were six sessions total. And I'll do the thing I do when where uh, I put it up there when uh, when I didn't write something down. But anyway, it's how on bongos for this. Uh, notable that a song speeds up a little on the second verse. Not really uh, Hal's fault. I think it's the guitar players pushing it. Carl, the Beatles fan, seems to be leading this. His voice is the most prominent, though Brian is loudest on the falsetto parts. It's really short because they drop out the whole part with the harmonica solo on the Beatles thing. Um, so this thing is only a minute and a half long or something like that. At the end, Brian demands to know how Tell Me Why goes, saying it's his favorite Beatles song. It's, it's to show us how spontaneous this is, it's just complete BS because they had already recorded Tell Me Why. It was one of the first things that they tracked. <laughs> so, right in then to Tell Me Why, uh, which was recorded at the second session. Uh, again, the first session where they got anything good. That's the September 8th session. Um, so it starts right up as if it had been done in sequence, which it wasn't. Once again, Brian and Carl seem to be leading it, though there's a lot of random extra vocalizing. Carl's very prominent on the bridge and on the ending. Um, this is, again, Hal Blaine on the bongos, Terry and Ron, Terry or Ron, we don't know, the bang of the tambourine. Um, don't know who the bass player is, but it's pretty complex bass line, so I'm going to say it's probably Brian. It's interesting that they're going for Lennon straight through on this album. You, you would sort of think the band were McCartney fans, just given the whole Brian, uh, Paul, Gemini thing, but they, they, all three tunes they did are John Lennon tunes, and if I recall, they're John Lennon solo compositions. I'm not 100% sure about that. My Beatles knowledge is not up there with my Beach Boys knowledge. Um, this is also from uh, the American version of the Hard Day's Night soundtrack. I think it was on something new in um, the British release of the Beatles. It's interesting to compare the harmonies to the Beatles version. Uh, the Beatles version has more complicated harmonies uh, with a pedal tone. That's when someone sings uh, one note while the other parts move around it. There's a pedal tone on the Beatles version that isn't on the Beach Boys version, but the Beatles version, interestingly, is actually sloppier than the sloppy Beach Boys version. There's like a third part on the Why You Lie To Me that isn't on the Beatles version, and it is strangely satisfying to hear that. It's that kind of thing. When, when most of us learn how to sing harmony, the way we will do it is we'll add the third harmony to a two-part uh, two part bit, like at Everly Brothers song or something like that. Anyway, you, you add the third part to any two part thing. And that's usually how most of us train our ears to sing harmony because you can hear right away when the triad locks in and you can tell that you're doing it right. So they kind of instinctively add a third part on Tell Me Why where there kind of isn't one. And so it's funny to think about the Beatles Tell Me Why, the way they record it, the sloppy vocals on it are very party like, even though it is in, in the party version seems a bit more structured than the Beatles version. So that's kind of interesting because there's a lot of hanging notes and such on the Beatles version, whereas the Beach Boys, as I said, dump that pedal tone. But there's a lot of love in this uh, in this version. And, uh, and this actually is a, one of the more widely known tracks from this album, because although it wasn't a single, it was included on the Spirit of America compilation in 1975, which was a very big hit. It was the, I think, the only other song from this album that was on that compilation. So a lot of people heard that independently of having heard this album. And they start talking then about Papa Umau Mau because, of course, this is all running into each other. They're all doing it in a row. Um, so that leads us to the third track, which is Papa Umau Mau. Now, they just did this. They just did this song on the concert album. Uh, to me, this is sort of, yeah, okay, whatever. Anyway, so they just did this on concert. It's a cover of a band called The Rivingtons. We talked about that on the concert episode. I'm not gonna go through all that again. Can Brian match his performance on the concert? Well, to me, he comes surprisingly close. I had speculated a little bit on uh, the Summer Days and Summer Nights show that Brian may have lost a little of his top range. He's got all the notes here. He hits everything uh, on this one, so maybe not. Uh, as I said, their photographer, Hal Avery, is on the bongos. That's because uh, Hal Blaine had to leave. So this is whatever session he had to leave on. It's third or fourth session. I don't remember. I'll put it up there. Um, the harmonies, considering they've done this and done it not long ago, surprisingly disorganized. Um, 
I love the blue guitar and the big breakdown. That's really kind of cool. Uh, and Mike goes, I can't seem to remember all the words. What's to remember? Papa Ooh and Mau Mau. And Mau, they're twice. So I don't know what's going on there, Mike. Uh, but uh, we have this thing going on where the band is just deliberately, you know, if they make a mistake, they're just calling he all kinds of attention to it rather than trying to fix it, which sort of sets the tone for this record. And it's brilliant because, first of all, it's really funny hearing bands screw up. Secondly, everyone knows the Beach Boys can sing and they still sound pretty good. So no one's going to go, oh, those guys suck. But it also lets them off the hook for anything on the album that does suck. I mean, it's genius. Brian Wilson is indeed a genius, but not always uh, for reasons that we, we, we think of. Uh, so I love Brian going, ha, 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 understand um, that he kind of throws away a line there. Um, oh, this is the September 14th session. I, ha I did have it written here. So uh, this and the uh, I should have known better from September 14th. Up to this point, we've heard basically no Dennis, and he was he, he skipped most of the September 14th session because of bronchitis. Um, if I recall correctly, uh, it was Teen Set. or some teen magazine that wrote up this session, and I should have read the, uh, the article again. I didn't. I suck. Uh, but they do talk about uh, Hal having to leave and Dennis leaving the sessions uh, because, again, he was sick, and he couldn't really sing very well. This brings us to the song Mountain of Love, which is a song we're going to have a lot of stuff to talk about. Uh, the song Mountain of Love was uh, released by a guy named Harold Dorman, who I've never heard of, uh, but it, it came out as a single in 1960. He wrote it. It went to number 21 uh, on the Billboard Hot 100, number 7 on the R&B sales chart. And uh, then there was a... Uh, Charlie Pride covered it in 1981, but we don't care. Uh, Dorman was, um, he didn't do much. He died in 1988 while he was traveling in McKinney, Texas. That's what Wikipedia says is all I got for Harold Dorman. Uh, we got some good 12 string action on this one. Very deep bass sound on this, yeah, and that is Bruce. Uh, we know that Bruce plays on this. I do want to note that there's, a, there's some tracks where the, the bass is just deep and full. Um, and it, that does seem to be Bruce when, when we hear that. And it's interesting uh, because uh, without knowing it was him, I had sort of flagged the, the sound of the bass, the really rich sound of the bass. Um, so I don't know what's different about Bruce's attack or how he had the bass settings for when he played it because they were just passing the bass back and forth. But it would seem that on this album, if you hear something that's very simplistic but got a lot of ass to it, that's Bruce. And if it's a little more complicated and a little thinner, that's going to be Brian. Uh, but, you know, it's just a guess. Uh, Mike is in his elements on this. Like, once again, just totally selling the uh, recording. Um, he goes again to falsetto when he's laughing, something he likes to do. Uh, Marilyn is very prominent on the backups, seemingly, or, or is it Bruce? You know, Bruce can sound a little girly sometimes, but I think it's Marilyn. Uh, the parties are unusually parallel for uh, the Beach Boys. There's no sort of counterpunctual action. Everything's kind of going up and down in tandem. Uh, Brian stole this bridge for Little Children, which was a song on his uh, first solo album, Brian Wilson, in 1988. And who is the harmonica player? Is it Dennis? It is not. And here we have the introduction of a very key player, in the Beach Boys saga. Uh, it, it, there's a lot of sort of candidates for the seventh or eighth or ninth or tenth Beach Boys. The, the, the guy that's not in the Beach Boys but is in the Beach Boys. Uh, and this is certainly one of them. And we are talking about the late lamented Billy Hinchy. It is Billy playing harmonica on this track. Um, this is his first of many, many appearances with the Beach Boys all the way up to, um, you know, fairly close to his uh, unfortunate passing just a couple of years ago. Um, Billy Hinchy is someone that I want to talk about a little bit, and I'm sure a lot of you won't uh, be upset about that at all. Um, to let you know who he was, Billy was the son of wealthy Filipino immigrants who had relocated to Los Angeles. He had made friends with two other people and started a band. Uh, they were sons of celebrities. Uh, one was the son of Dean Martin, and the other was the son of Sammy Davis Jr. No, I'm just kidding. Um, the son of Desi Arnaz, uh, Lucille Ball's husband. Um, 
and they were all quite young. Billy was only 14 at the time of this recording, and he had already notched his first hit earlier that year with the band, which was called Dino Desi. And Billy, uh, the song is called I'm a Fool, and they had a follow-up hit, which was in the charts at this time, called Not the Love and Kind. So uh, Billy and uh, Dino and Desi had met the Beach Boys when they were uh, performing together uh, on various shows over the summer. And right around this time, at some point, um, Carl and Billy were at the airport, and Billy's sister Annie, who was a little older, I think she was 15, 16 at this time, came to pick them up. I guess she must have been 16 if she was picking them, because she would have had a uh, driver's license. Uh, but uh, Carl met Annie, and sparks flew, as they say. And uh, very soon, Carl and Annie were uh, dating, and they would actually be married within the year. Um, so at this point, Carl getting very tight with the Hinchy family, and it, it, I'm going way down a rabbit hole. I mean, nothing, nothing to do with the song here, but it's interesting to think that the Wilsons had a famously dysfunctional family dynamic, and Brian had already adopted a, a new family with the um, the Rovells, which is uh, his wife's family, and Brian would go over and hang out there, and so would Carl, and so would everybody else, and and that became a sort of loving, stable, chill family unit that uh, the Wilsons didn't have. Now you have Carl sort of adopting his own family, the Hinchies, which, like many Filipino families, very tight-knit, very welcoming. Um, Billy's dad, uh, Pops Hinchie, would become a father figure to Dennis later in life. Dennis's song, Farewell, My Friend, is about uh, Billy's dad. So it's interesting that you, you have these, these family units outside of the Wilson family that provide the sort of nurturing environment that was somewhat lacking in the Wilson household. I don't want to say it was completely lacking because the, the band loved their mom, Audrey. So, um, you know, whatever the failings of the Wilson parents, Audrey at least created some kind of a nurturing um, environment for the kids, but it's well documented the Wilson family was messed up. So it's interesting to think about this because I've spent some time in the orbit of the Beach Boys, not, you know, not in, really as insider, but, but I've been able to observe the dynamic that surrounds the band. And it is very much a family. And when I say a family, um, this includes people like Billy's family and the Rovells and Al's family. And, 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 you know, a lot of these people will just get together socially. And I'm saying up to the present day, you know, I've gone to to things that where Beach Boys are there and you know they'll all be hanging out together and 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 I think this family thing it has its roots in this dynamic where the Wilsons kind of absorbed these other families and everybody became intermingled and it became this one big family and very a very close-knit one to this very day you know they all kind of hang out together they all they all care a lot about each other I don't think every single one of them hangs out with each other every single day but this family dynamic that took root in the 60s carries through to the present day. Um, I want to say about Billy, um, I knew him. Uh, it was my pleasure to perform with him a couple times. And once he gave me a very key assignment, taking his place, musical directing the Carl Wilson Foundation concert, and uh, where you know I got to play with you know three of the Beach Boys and Billy and and the Honeys and a lot of other people. Uh, and uh, I, as an expat to Asia, uh, I might not be here if uh, Billy had not intervened at a point when I was going to back out on my first trip to Manila. Um, I called Billy, even though I didn't really know him that well, and uh, asked him if he knew anybody uh, to help me, you know, find my way around kind of a sketchy place, which was Manila. And uh, Billy uh, got on the phone and hooked me up with his cousin, and, and I became helped by this whole family dynamic myself. And... Uh, you know, up until recently I lived in Manila. So had that not happened 10 years ago, I might not be talking to you right now very happily as an Asian expat. So um, I have a lot of respect for Billy Hinchy, and I know a lot of you do too, and he's very sorely missed. Um, but it's nice to think that, uh, that here he is on this album as a 14-year-old kid, and he's getting to play for the first time in a major record because he didn't really get to play in the Dino Desi and Billy singles, to my knowledge, maybe he did a little bit. I think it was mostly session guys. But he's getting to play on a Beach Boys record, 14 years old, and what that, what a thrill that must have been 
to be in that environment with them and just kind of doing this thing. And it does kind of go to the beauty of this album because it was a kind of a fake party, okay? It was all, the whole pretense of it was bogus. But it, it, it rock and roll is, it was once explained that rock and roll doesn't have to be spontaneous, it just has to sound spontaneous. And so much of this album just feels and sounds right for the concept they're trying to approach it with and having Billy kind of come up and do harmonica, just step right up here and come on kid, here's your shot. And boy, did he, uh, did he make the most of that shot. So Billy Henshee, a hero of the Beach Boy story, making his first appearance here on Mountain of Love. Uh, okay, the addendum, one more thing on Mountain of Love, because I, 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 I could swear that uh, Johnny Rivers had a hit with that around this time, and I didn't see that in the Wikipedia entry, so I'm going to do some live Googling right now. This is tough stuff to see if my memory is correct. Facebook, no, we don't want to go to that. Mountain of Love, Johnny Rivers. Okay, here we go. Live Google action. Okay, he did do it. Johnny Rivers in action, Mountain of Love. Okay. Oh, I, I, sorry, it was, here it is. In 1964, Johnny Rivers released his remake using members of the Wrecking Crew as a single at reached number nine on Billboard Hot 100. Yeah, kind of important. So anyway, they, that's why we didn't know about Harold Dorman. Uh, it, was a, it was a Johnny Rivers cover gaping hole in my research there sorry but i did i did i did recover nicely i think you'll agree um so that would they were going off the johnny rivers um thing uh kenny lynch also had a um a cover of the song for all you people in the uk that was hit in 1960 i don't think it's well remembered um but it's kind of interesting to to think that the beach boys did a johnny rivers cover because um when brian had his famous argument with uh, Murray, his dad, uh, and, and Murray talks about making phony music for money and Brian references Johnny Rivers. It's not like kind of a Johnny Rivers diss. Um, so it's interesting that um, Brian uh, chose to do a Johnny Rivers cover, maybe felt guilty. Uh, well, I don't know why he'd feel guilty. Johnny Rivers, I'm sure, didn't hear the conversation with Murray. Or did he? Anyway. Moving right along, recovered from my little boo-boo there. Let's go to You've Got to Hide Your Dang Love Away. That, once again, a John Lennon track being covered. A hummy Strummy John Lennon track. This one was a very recent track. It had been released in August 65 on the Help soundtrack. And at the time of the recording, uh, the English uh, folk group The Silky had a hit with a Beatles participation. Three of the Beatles were either involved in the production or played on it. Um, and uh, the song had not yet reached this peak of number 10, which it would reach in, in October. So this was very much a current song for uh, the time. Jan and Dean were also uh, doing this around this time live. Uh, it was on their aborted and later released Filet of Soul album and, in an arrangement derived from the Silkies version. And uh, Jan would continue to do it uh, in their post-accident comeback in the 70s, and you can hear a version of that on their 1981 uh, live album, One Summer Night. Um, so this is Dennis's vocal for the album. Uh, you know, he missed out on the last album, and I can see why, even though he was in poor shape vocally at the time because of his bronchial infection, they felt like they had to get him on because he was a very popular uh, member of the band and he was shut out of the lead singing on the last album so he had to have at least a token appearance on this one um, they had to do a bunch of tries to get this vocal out of them and it's a compelling version uh, but if you listen real carefully you can you can hear that he's struggling that his voice is really scratchy the double track is comes apart at various places pretty disorganized I'm not dissing the track and a lot, sometimes people misunderstand when I'm critiquing a track technically because as a musician you can hear stuff that that is you know a little out of spec it doesn't mean you don't like it it's you're just calling attention to some technical things about the track I really like this version as often happens with Dennis the raggedness of the vocal kind of makes it work but I'm sure you know if he could have done it without having a bronchial infection he would have been a lot happier and I think they did this three or four times over various sessions before they got this out of him. This version is actually from the last session they did on September 17th, 
It's worth mentioning that Carl Wilson is on bass for this track and only this track. Carl had requested that Bruce not play on it and Carl would overdub it later. Um, and uh, Carl does, so Carl does overdub it. And at two minutes, he screws up, <laughs> which is kind of interesting since it's the one track where they had an overdub bass track. I don't know why that Carl, of all people, would have messed it up. Uh, but it's noticeable because there are very few backing vocals on this track, um, except for the hey, which is pretty chaotic and weird. Someone's banging on a Celeste, uh, apparently Brian. Steve Korthoff is on bongos. You can hear Marilyn really loud on the hey. And uh, someone says uh, at some point at the end, someone took my teeth away, but it's, you know, they're saying it like they have no teeth, and it sounds like they say teeth. And I'm wondering if that's not a deliberate little blue joke by the Beach Boys, I don't know. But uh, they then set up the next song, Devoted to You. Again, they're doing this thing where they're, they, they seem to have some concept by the time they do the party, part of the album, of, of the sequencing of the album, because they're, they're setting up the next track, even though it, in most cases it wasn't recorded sequentially to how it was put on the album. But it was very funny, Brian, uh, comment about uh, the next one, which is Devoted to You, which is a song they're going to do pretty straight. And so Brian doesn't want the crowd to mess up what's going to be a pretty performance. So he says, if you don't know it, then shut up and go home. Well, that's telling him, Brian. So that brings us to the next track, which is... Just had to get some more use out of that. Devoted to You. Now, this is probably my favorite track on the album. Because uh, it's it's a genuinely nice performance. It, it doesn't rely on the party concept, which can get tedious. I mean, you know, this, I, look, let's be honest about it. If you're not in the mood to have this party with the Beach Boys, you're not going to be, you know. Ever been to a party and you're not feeling it? You know, I can understand how some people would be like that with this album. Uh, but Brian and Mike uh, do, a, uh, do a straight version of this Everly Brothers. Flip side, it was the flip side of Bird Dog. Uh, it was just... Uh, was number 10 in the U.S., went to number one in Canada, and that was in 1958. This is uh, Felix and Boudel Bryant uh, composition. They wrote a lot of the Everly Brothers' greatest songs. This is a callback to Brian and Mike's teenage years when they would sit in Mike's Rambler and uh, harmonize in two-part harmony. Uh, and, uh, you know, you can, there's, as is true with most of the tracks, there's a lot of love that is... Uh, is gone into this performance and I don't just mean Mike you can tell that they really they really have an affinity I'm sure Brian and Mike whose blend we've seen uh, quite effectively on, on some other tracks most no most notably on the Christmas album they have a natural blend with each other independently of the band which again goes back to their teenage years so the combination of that and the 12 string acoustic which is gorgeous uh, this is just a really nice performance. Nice enough that it got recycled on the much later Hawthorne, California rarities compilation without the party effects added. Um, it's no double tracking. It's just a gorgeous and sensitive uh, reading. And this would later become the B-side to Getting Hungry, which is a bizarre Brian Wilson and Mike Love duo single that was pulled off the Smiley Smile album that came out in 1967. No one seems to really understand why that happened. I'm going to definitely speculate about that when we get to that album. Noteworthy, at two minutes and four seconds, there's a whiff on the guitar. And that's it for Devoted to You.